So government spending is a percentage of GDP. So you have historical. This is historical path of government spending as a percentage of GDP. And then your current path, the current pathway we're on here will take us to a point where we're about, a, we're about a percentage of 50% of GDP at this point. Uh, by making reductions in spending, we can keep our spending as a percentage of GDP as a historical average. So regardless of where we are in taxes, you cannot spend money at that rate. Taxes as a percentage of GDP? How much are you going to cut in advance? I don't think it's a Q&A. There was an appropriation vote just for this last So, the Medicare issue is one that yes, has sir. come up a lot. It's been part of a lot of the discussion. We have two choices on Medicare. And I understand there's people on both sides. I want to talk about the different sides, what I believe to be the correct path. And I'm sure someone can uh, articulate the other side on this. Uh, first of all, the path that we're on is if you're 55 or above, there's no change to Medicare. So how many folks in the room are 55 and above? That's not, that's not true. So, so, so you 55 and above, <laughs> no change in Medicare, no disruptions, uh, you preserve and protect Medicare. Get a system of, 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 system of health insurance similar to what I have, similar no. to what members of Congress it's have, not. similar it's to what all of these have. Wealthy get less, sick and low income get more support, so it's means tested, so those of you who like to make sure uh, that uh, the, the rich don't get as much assistance as the poor, and it's a guaranteed no, Medicare plan. It preserves Medicare and continues it. No, 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 no. uses rationing board for benefit and provider cuts. Uh, it imposes nearly 10,000 cuts per senior. Does not save Medicare. Because the president's plan to handle these Medicare proposals is to have a 15 person board that will essentially tell doctors or tell hospitals no. that they're going to pay no. us. No. Or they're going to ration no. and so, and so you now and so, by the and so the challenge yes. is, is can you find a way to save Medicare for particularly the seniors that are on it right now, and for the generations like going that. forward, uh, and avoid Medicare going bankrupt. And so that's the real challenge of the real debate in this country. And the good thing is, is that we are having a very healthy debate about this in Washington. Uh, the President has a proposal, uh, the House has a proposal, uh, and members of Congress are frequently meeting with the President so that we can come together as a country and try to solve this problem. Because nobody wins if both sides sit in their tents and tell the other side that they're completely wrong. And so that's my goal, is to try to find ways in which we can uh, discuss these issues. I know there are other sides in this debate, and that's the, the point of having this town hall meeting. So my hope is that we can continue to discuss these issues and continue to find ways to work together as a community to solve these problems. Because we all know the facts. We can't keep borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar. We know that. We know there are a variety of issues on the table, and we know we need to discuss which makes the most sense for job creation, uh, for the economy, and for the future of this country. And so with that, I would love to take an opportunity to take a few questions and have a response. Yes, sir. Right there. Congressman Yoder. Yes, sir. Would you please stop calling the suspension of the big oil companies giveaway subsidy a tax increase? It's not. Yes. They don't pay their fair share. They never have. Seen and not heard, and try to make you do what they want to do. And I did not believe that bill 
uh, did the things that we need to do to get this country back on sound, sound structural footing. I cannot continue to uh, cast my vote for things that continue to borrow that much money, continue to spend money we don't have, our children and grandchildren's money. So I am happy to cast a vote for what I believe the right principles are and what I believe in and what I think this district believes in, but I'm not going to cast a vote just because someone in Washington tells me to. And I do appreciate your comment and encouragement to do that. Um, I, I appreciate that very much. So, Yes, ma'am. We'll get you a Oh, I'm sorry. The chef, we'll come back to you because the microphone's over here. Come to you next. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Representative Miller, in 2001 and 2003, President Bush passed tax cuts of $1.3 trillion, primarily designated for the wealthiest of Americans. In 2003, President Bush started unnecessary war in Iraq after our country was attacked by 19 terrorists from a base in Afghanistan. In 2006, President Bush passed a $600 billion Medicare Part D program which is a team dialed to healthcare and home And in 2008, President Bush passed a $700 billion toxic asset relief program designed to bail out the, the uh, very people who caused the economic calamity. So my question is, why is there always enough money for war? Why is there always enough yeah. money to take care of the wealthiest people in this country? But when it's time to pay the bill, the Republican Congress is asking people like myself, in the middle, in middle class Americans like myself, I certainly appreciate the question. I appreciate the point, which is that I believe that both parties have been fiscally irresponsible. Okay? I don't think anyone's hands are clean in this situation. And, and my comments are not uh, to be one in which uh, I, there's too much of this. In the, it's on the House floor, it's in everywhere we go, and it's not productive. And so, uh, I think there are many things that happened in the, in, the, in the last decade in which Republicans are running government, which they overspent, which they made poor fiscal decisions, in which they made decisions that are inconsistent with the philosophy that many espouse. And so, I think you make a very good point. The question is, what can we do about it, and what are the things we can do going forward to solve this problem? Okay? We have a situation in which, if, if we pass the taxes that are being proposed by the President, and I understand it's just a start, I got that, I got that point. It doesn't get you to $1.6 trillion. Dollars. And so I want to talk about this globally. So let's say we did do that. We passed the $60 billion a year and the $2 billion for oil companies. We have to talk about what are the things we could do to try to figure out a way to lower the cost of doing business in government. Because I don't think anyone will disagree that we can't afford to spend what we're spending. And I think intelligent minds will disagree about whether we should raise taxes or how much we should cut. But we can't afford to spend this much of GDP. And so the question is whether it's Farm subsidies, defense spending, uh, 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 providing uh, modifications to entitlement programs. What are the things we can do? What are the things on the table? And that's the dialogue I'm interested in having. Although I think you make very valid points, and one that I think is very much part of the discourse that we have in this country right now, which is, wait a second, your guys', your guys hands aren't clean. Don't come in and lecture us about fiscal responsibility when you guys had your hand in the cookie jar as well. And I think that's a very valid point. I think it's a very salient point, and it's one that Republicans should own up to. And I think if they're being intellectually honest, they will. So the question is, what are the things we can do going forward? There are some solutions that we've offered here. It's going to be very, very difficult. I don't think anything is going to solve this problem without a bipartisan solution, particularly when you have a Republican speaker, a Democratic majority leader, and a Democratic president. And you know, in the 90s, we saw some of the good numbers. The Republican Congress and a Democratic president, uh, they did welfare reform, they did all sorts of reform that both sides said wasn't right. But somehow they got it done. So my hope is that this new Congress uh, in, this, in this president, that we can put down the rhetoric, we can stop talking about birth certificates, we can stop talking about all these things, we can talk about how do we solve the problems facing this country, given the context of the mistakes that both parties have made in 